Coburn is the author of The Golden Age is in Us, Journeys and Encounters. Uh, the very first four words of this book are two questions. Golden Age, question mark. This is in the foreword. In Us, question mark. What are you writing about? It's a journal, actually, of the last uh, eight years um, of uh, history and of my life. It, it deals with you know, the fall of communism, it deals with political events in this country, but it also deals with what happens to me as a, as a fairly radical writer, how I, how I deal with people, what happened to me personally. Um, the idea of the Golden Age, it's actually a quote from Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and uh, Rousseau said, the Golden Age which blind superstition had placed behind or ahead of us is in us. And the idea is really to say to people, particularly uh, on the more liberal left end, you know, we're very used to spreading gloom and doom and saying how awful things are, but you never really get anywhere just telling people how awful things are. You have to give people an idea, a utopia, a, a way of enunciating what you want to happen in the society, what you think the dream of the, the good and the beautiful is. And so there's no use looking at some model of the distant past or some dream of the remote future, we've really got to go with what we've got now and <clears throat> try and sketch out ways forward. People that you don't, one of my themes in the book is you just, you never get anywhere just being miserable and telling people gloom and doom. You, you've got to give people an objective and a sense of hope. I mean, this is nothing particularly original about this, but on the... <laughs> On the left, it, it can be a rather startling thought to some people. What hope, then, do you give people in this book? Well, I think I give uh, many kinds of hope. I mean, the book deals with the dreams that many people have, uh, whether it be, uh, I mean, to start very far west, Hawaiians. Uh, I've, I have many friends in the Hawaiian national movement, sovereignty movement, who have a very clear dream of what they want to happen. They want to recover their rights. Or um, I took about my friends in the labor movement, you know, uh, which is ignored very largely in the media. You wouldn't think, when you look at the media, you wouldn't know that really 13 million people are in organized labor. You, you never see much of organized labor on TV apart from photographs of Lane Kirkpatrick about once a year. Um, what their fights are all about. I talk about things like um, work. Like everybody, on the left, people are always talking about full employment. Uh, no one really believes there's going to be full employment, and in fact, this society doesn't need full employment. If people, people, too few people work too hard, and too many people don't have enough work, if you spread it out, you could say, I noticed that uh, in Europe now, one country has just called for a 35-hour week. But you, why don't you be radical about it and say, how much work does the society really need? If everybody worked a bit, you could maybe have a 25-hour week if you, of course, redistributed the money, so you didn't have all the money going to the top of the tree. But then I talk on personal levels, too, about what golden age is and what relationships are about. What is a golden age? What are you, what are you writing about? Well, originally, the golden age, it's actually interesting. The golden age, uh, as conceived by the ancient poets, um, it was the age of Saturn, and it was a time when, you know, uh, normal rules of dominance were reversed. There was a special day. Actually, it was called a Saturnalia. Now, these days, a Saturnalia means a, a lewd debauch. That's what the word has come to mean. In classical times, it was a day when the masters of Rome, let's say, they threw aside their togas and their splendid emblems of rank, and they put on the clothes of the servants, and the servants assumed the role of masters. Everything was reversed, and the masters waited on the servants, and normal social rules were changed around. And this was usually a late spring festival. In fact, uh, the New Orleans, uh, you know, what's the big festival in New Orleans? Mardi Gras. Like? Mardi Gras is a very late sort of version of that. These, these sort of festivals that come along where there is the, the, the Lord of the Feast, the Lord of Misrule, Comus and Rex. And so, uh, by the time the Middle Ages came along, the idea of the social reversal had gone, and it was left with the idea of a dr drunken debauch. So uh, that's a golden age. Everybody has different golden ages. The right-wingers have a golden age, you know, a golden age where, I don't know, the deficit has been wiped out. <laughs> you've balanced the budget, and you've sent everybody to 
Christian schools. <laughs> well, in talking about, you mentioned the right wing, um, in your book, do you talk about or what hope do you give to liberals uh, in light of uh, recent uh, conservative uh, political gains? Oh, well, I think liberals have spent too much time, like, defeating themselves. You know, when, if, you, if you're on your knees, you know, everything looks like James Connolly or someone said, you know, the great only look great because you're on your knees. And uh, the, the liberals on the left are so used to sort of whining about the right that they, they've invented an enemy which is far bigger than it actually is. I mean, let's take the supposed right wing huge swing to the right last November. Well, first of all, it's only 38% of the eligible vote voted. If you look at polls about the nation as a whole, many, many people, in fact, a majority want a third party, and they want the third party to be the left of the Democrats or the Republicans. Of course, it's very hard to be to the right of the Democrats and Republicans. You've got not much room to squeeze in there. But uh, like the environmental movement. I write a lot about the environmental movement in the book. Um, they had a poll last year which showed that, you know, most America, every American really calls himself an environmentalist, even People in the wise use movement say they're good environmentalists and the enviros they say are idiots. But most people support the idea of a clean environment, a healthy environment. And the question is how you do it. I think the national environmental organizations have just lost any idea of, of how to convince people of the justice of their cause. They're elitists. They sit in Washington. They spend a bunch of money and don't do very much. And I think in many ways the wise use movement is onto a sound case when they criticize him. Uh, if you go to people directly, clearly say, you know, look, we have to try and save what remains, let's say, of the forests. It's possible that jobs could be provided for people. I mean, all, most of the logs are exported. They aren't even dealt with by, let's say, carpenters on the northwest coast. There are things for people to do. There are sound solutions. Um, as long as you're fairly uncompromising and don't con constantly engage in sort of backdoor diplomacy here in, uh, in Washington where you end up agreeing to cut down half the forest because that seems like a good compromise. I say you've got to be direct in the way you propose things. I looked in the uh, index to see uh, who might have had the most mentions just out of curiosity and uh, I said Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan were two people that got a lot of mentions yeah, but, but the Coburn family together um, got uh, quite a few mentions. Who are the other Coburns in your book? Well, there's, there's um, yeah, because it's a personal diary as well as a political one. And um, um, I do write about my family. Well, I write about my father who, 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 and my mother, both of whom are dead now, uh, both of whom are, were very interesting p people and obviously molded me, and I write about that. My brother, I have one brother right here in Washington, Andrew, and his wife, uh, Leslie Coburn. They're, they're journalists. My other brother, Patrick, is a journalist in Jerusalem uh, for a British paper. And my daughter, Daisy, and... I, uh, you know, I evoke them, I talk about them, and uh, to show, the idea is not always, most, when you do a, a political journal, it comes out as a, you know, woke up, read the paper, felt bad, went back to bed, or whatever it is, or, uh, or personal diaries, people might think, why am I reading this stuff? What I'm trying to do is show how big events in history, between 87 and 94, and let's say the fall of communism, uh, and personal events, like, let's say, the death of my mother, in um, 89, how the 88, how, how these affect the way I look at the world. I mean, I write a lot. I have a lot, a lot of readers around the country, and uh, I've always tried to, to give people a sense of who I am, where I am, what I thought during this time, how my mind was changed, where I went. I've been in, I live on the West Coast. I've been in three earthquakes now. I'm a real earthquake veteran. In fact, you write quite a bit about Earth. I write about natural disasters quite a lot. And what disaster means, what normalcy means, what accident means. Like, uh, I'm always very interested in the way people define an accident against the normal. Like when the Exxon Valdez went down, everyone in the, up in Alaska, everyone said that's, a, that's an accident. Well, then you have to ask, what's normal? Well, normal would have been for the Exxon Valdez to go down the west coast of, Ca the coast of California, you know, go to Long Beach, discharge its crude oil, have the crude oil refined, put it in a bunch of motor cars and have discharged the oil over Los Angeles. That's normal. And of course, if you look at the lungs of young people in poor districts of Los Angeles, like Wilmington or wherever, you know, they've got the lungs of, of fairly old people. It's normal that that happens according to the accident normal thing. So 
I write a lot about how you come to accept things, and you say, oh, well, that's normal and that isn't normal. Like, you know, uh, nuclear war. Everyone said, we haven't had nuclear war, and normalcy was peace. And then you find, of course, for 50 years, you know, there have been constant emissions of radioactivity. So peace turns out to have been like hot peace, and, you know, all these kind of things. Well, I mentioned uh, all of the, uh, the Coburn family, but also Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan, uh, prominent uh, mentions. Uh, why are they important in the Golden Age? Well, if ever someone believed in the Golden Age, it was Ronald Reagan. I don't know what Bill Clinton's Golden Age. Well, I obviously write about them because they're presidents. Uh, Reagan and Reaganism, you know, molded our era. Um, uh, I've described, I was at the, uh, you know, the um, New Orleans Convention, which I think was his last one. I write a lot about him. He was a very central figure to, to the imaginative life of the country and to the political life of the country. Clinton, I don't like Clinton. I'm, beastly about him quite a lot of the time in the book. But, you know, the, these are our totemic political figures, so of course there's a lot about them. Besides uh, your thoughts down here, you include letters from uh, people who are friends and also not so friendly. Why did you think that was necessary in the book? Well, since I, I mean, I write columns and I write uh, for the Nation magazine and I write a syndicated column, um, you know, and I also uh, I'm very keen on a paper in California I write for called the Anderson Valley Advertiser. Cause I what think, is that? That's oh, it's a very feisty uh, local paper in Mendocino County, edited by a dear friend of mine, Bruce Anderson. And it's a wonderful paper. It's, it's politically radical, but it writes in a very accessible way that ordinary people can understand. It's not sort of fancy. And I believe that the lifeblood of real journalism, you know, is local journalism, where you, you, know, you can report most local papers are deadly. Like school, and they write about school boards in, in a way that's so boring you want to fall over or supervises meetings and you have no idea what really went on. And the AVA, the Anderson Valley Advertiser, does it the right way. So, you, you know, you're excited. And people love the newspaper. About half its readership is across the country. And, you know, they, they get to know the way the soups, meeting of the county soups is reported because it's, you know, it's the meeting of every county soups in every county in America. Uh, um, I got so excited talking about that I forgot what you asked me in the first place. Uh, Oh, letters from readers. Uh, and I wanted to give a sense of people reacting. I have a pretty polemical life. And people are always writing in saying that I'm talking nonsense. And then I engage with them and I say that, no, I'm not talking nonsense. I'm telling the way it is. And I wanted to put these letters in to show, A, that, to show how people that are involved. That not the idea of just a writer sitting in the study typing on his typewriter. I still have a typewriter, I've got to say. But dealing with people, whether it's the fellow who writes in saying I'm a horrible human being and he's glad my mother's dead, uh, to people, Oliver Stone attacking me for my attack on his movie, JFK. It's, it's to show that like there's a world in which I'm involved. You mentioned the typewriter in the, uh, in the afterword I noted here, you write, my loathing of the computer means that I type on the instrument scorned by Bill Clinton in his State of the Union address. January 95, a typewriter, variously an IBM Selectric, a pre-war Royal SX, and an, Underword, and an Underwood 5. Why do you load the computer? I think too many claims are made for it. I think it, in many ways it enslaves people. Uh, I, I, I don't write a lot of drafts, uh, it's true. I hate to look in the screen, it hurts my eyes. Um, how do I, people always then say, but how do you modem and you can move things around and they go on for hours about the ineffable beauties and joys of the computer. And uh, Bill Clinton, fairly, Bill Clinton and Gingrich are very similar in their, in their belief in the computer and their profound belief in progress through technology. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting that, that uh, President Bill dumped on the typewriter in, the, uh, in his State of the Union. I like typewriters because you take them anywhere. They're, they're nice machines. The Underwood 5, which is like from the 1920s. I mean, I've written millions of words on it. It still works just fine. Uh, I have a fax machine. I can send things off to people. And I think the computer actually makes people write too fast. Very often, if you look at someone they've written on a computer, it's like transcribed speech. I mean, I think ideally you should have an implement. I'm pretty fluent that slows you up slightly. I mean, not the chisel and the piece of stone, which is like real slow, but, uh, you know, the medieval monk had, you know, he was doing his cursive. And sometimes if I'm like having a problem with writing something, I think it's good to go and get a pencil and, you know, take time to try and, so to speak, carve it out. I, li I don't like the way the computers, you can just obliterate things. I think it's important that you have a sense of, do I really want to write this? Because I'm then going to have to cross it out. 
There should be a little bit of effort involved in it. And the productivity in the computer people go on. IBM, before it got into computers, used to do studies showing that office productivity was, went down with computers because people were always fooling around with the font and they were perfecting it and they were making it clean and, you know. We were talking about letters. Let me uh, close by asking you again something about letters in the future. Uh, when people read this book, uh, what do you hope they, they get from it? And what would you like to hear from them if they chose to wrote you a, write you a letter after reading it? I would like people to read the book and feel that, that I've taken them into an imaginative and a political life that makes sense to them. That I might seem like an offensive person, let's say. I'm a lefty, I, you know, this, that, and maybe views that might superficially appear abhorrent. And that when I've tried to show the universe and the history in which I move, they'll see that my view of the world is, is interesting and hopefully persuasive. But that the golden age really is there for people. If you, if you look towards a hope, whether you're a, a very right-wing person who has dreams which, you know, with which I mightn't have relation. I mean, right-wing people have dreams of freedom. I mean, maybe some of my views and some of their views coincide. You know, there is a bunch of people who... Uh, the, f the movement for a fully informed jury, which is regarded maybe they have, they're in Helmville, Montana. Now, their idea of freedom, I respect. I think that's great. I think there are too many areas where the right and the left think they're at logheads where they're not, really. And you have to try and... I'm not talking about all this nonsense they've had on the papers about, you know, the extreme left and the extreme right and bombing and all that. No, uh, that's not, nothing to do with that kind of stuff. But what I, what are I, what are, in the end, it's an idea of freedom we're talking about. That's what the whole game is about. How, what is a free life? What is a free society? And for too long, the dialogues of left and right have been apart. And what I would like people to enter that book and see, no, I share, I share a lot of those feelings. I, I agree with that. The book is The Golden Age is Innes, the author, Alexander Coburn. Thank you very much. Thanks.